the mic was on. I hereby call this meeting to order at 6.38 p.m. We will now move to section two, swearing in. If you were confirmed last week, please stand and raise your right hand. And if you accept at the end, please respond with I do. Do you hereby swear that you will faithfully serve the students of Wichita State University, act in accordance with the constitution of the student body, fulfill all duties and responsibilities of the office in which you are about to enter, and to the best of your ability, preserve, protect, and defend the constitution of the student body of Wichita State University? Congratulations. At this time, we will move into section three, roll call. With 38 members present, that means that simple majority is 20 and two thirds is 26. Thank you. We'll now move into section four, public forum and presentations. Public forum provides a chance for individuals to have the privilege of speaking before the Senate. This is the time for the association to listen to what the community has to say. And to that, we offer our undivided respect and attention. I would like to remind everyone that although we allow the speakers the privilege to use this platform, the opinions of the speakers do not necessarily reflect the opinions of the association nor the university. At this time, we will hear from Heather Stafford, Director of Student Health. Good evening, my name is Heather Stafford. I'm the Director of Student Health Services and I was asked to come and speak to you all tonight to talk to you about some of the updates that Student Health has completed in this last year. Um, we've been using your dollars wisely, I believe, and we've instituted a lot of new services over at Student Health to help our students out on campus. Um, I would probably say the ones that were the most effective was we thank you for contributing your fees and your judgment to help us bring in a new physician. Um, our new physician is Dr. Delane Vaughn. She comes from the KU School of Medicine and she was a nurse previously. She loves the students. She's very dynamic. She's very engaging with the students and she really promotes wellness. So that was a great hire for us. We are excited to get those extra funds to bring her into campus all five days of the week for a certain amount of hours, and she's really working well with the students. Some of the other services that we've started this year is that we have absorbed the task of prescribing ADHD medications for students on campus. Um, for many years, the Counseling and Prevention Services offices were doing that. Um, it kind of seemed like they needed a little bit of extra help with that, so right now we are being able to initiate and do follow-up med refills for students for ADHD medications. There's a process to that, but I think the fact that students can get in within 24 to 48 hours for their appointments for their refills is a pretty good advantage for our students. Um, some other things that we're doing now in student health is we now have x-ray services. Um, we don't have x-ray equipment. We are using a mobile radiology unit from the Kansas um, Radiology Group, or no, Wichita Radiology Group. They come in and they do x-rays and ultrasounds. And we've done over 70 x-rays and ultrasounds so far in just the first two and a half months of school. So I think that's been a really great advantage for our students. It's cheap and it's working well for them to get to come on campus and do this and not have to go out into the community and find somewhere to do it. Um, some other services that we have, we have an orthopedic clinic that we do every other Friday. Um, and this has brought in some not only extra service in the realm of helping students with sprains, um, strains, back pain, things like that, but it's also applied learning. So we brought in the athletic training department and their faculty to come in with their students, senior students, and do prescription um, exercise regimens with students. Um, we've been full every time we've done this clinic and we are actually full through the month of November. So we're gonna look at increasing those opportunities for students as well. 
Um, some of the other things that we're doing that are kind of unique is that um, we've started also carrying the mental health medications that we're prescribing to students that are not controlled substances, but your generic depression medicine, anxiety medicine, things like that in our institutional drug room so that students can get those medicines right there and not have to go outside to a pharmacy. So we carry um, like your generic Zoloft um, and different ones like that that are not controlled but then very easily accessible and cheaper for students. Um, another thing that we're doing, because we're trying to really help the mental health that's on campus right now, we're trying to help facilitate that help for students. Um, we have what we call gene site mental health medication testing. And what that does is we draw blood on students, we send that blood work out, that blood work comes back in about three to four days and it tells us exactly what medication that person should be taking for their mental health that is specific to their genetic makeup. And so we've put students on medicine that maybe they didn't even consider before and it's really working well. It's very expensive, but we're trying to find ways that we can help bring that to more students. Um, we all still have um, all of our mid-level providers, nurse practitioners, physician assistants, all of our nurses that help students. We're still doing free COVID testing and free COVID vaccinations. Um, you can come in and get a flu shot. They're $25, but you can bring in your insurance card and we'll file your insurance for you. Um, you know, same day appointments are usually pretty good if you call first thing in the morning or you look on our My Shocker Health portal. Um, if you get on the portal, you can also message a provider. You're all busy. You may not have time to come in for an appointment to see a, a provider, but sometimes just messaging a provider, they can give you some advice or say, you know, that rash is probably something we need to take a look at. Let's have you come in. And that's a good way for you to find times that are convenient for your schedule and still get some type of medical assistance. Um, so I don't know if this is appropriate, but can I open it up for questions? Yes, you may. Um, are there any questions at this time? Yes, Senator Bastian. Um, as an international student who uses a lot of these services, I'm really glad you've expanded it so much. Um, about the mental health medications and testings like that, mm -hmm. um, are international students able to access it or is it still required that they get tested outside and then submit? people walk to you. So it depends what service you're looking for. If you're looking for um, medications for anxiety, depression, you don't have to see anybody out in the community. You don't have to be tested for anything. But for ADHD medications, we, we want to make sure that we're prescribing appropriately. When you talk about stimulants like Adderall and Ritalin, you wanna make sure we're prescribing those appropriately. So we do ask that if you've had prior testing for ADHD, you just bring us the documentation. If you have never been tested for ADHD, we ask that you just meet with a counselor in counseling and prevention services, just to sit down and talk with them and so that they can kind of ask you some questions and do some screening and make sure that they also think it's an appropriate thing that would um, be beneficial for you. That's also kind of a way for them to see maybe there's some other things playing into ADHD. Maybe you could use some medication for anxiety and depression to go along with your ADHD medication. So we just want to make sure we're treating the student in a more well-rounded way. Good question. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, Chairperson Owens. In terms of the blood work, in terms of like your genetic makeup for mm -hmm. mental health um, medications, yeah. you said it was expensive. How yes. expensive? It's $350. Um, private insurances, some will pay for it. The federal insurances, like your Medicare, Medicaid, they pay 100% of that. Um, all I can say is it kind of just depends on the person's insurance plan. Um, we're looking to see how we can maybe help that a little bit, but since this is something that's probably not supported 100% by private insurance companies, we can't guarantee that that would be paid. Good question. Thank you. Yes, Senator Brello. Do you think the emotional well-being of WSU students would go up with greater access to hammocks? I would say I don't, not, uh, I'm not knowledgeable enough in that, that uh, topic to be able to provide any um, assistance to that. <laughs> Thank you. Senator yeah. Liu. So for the ADHD medicine, does a student need a prior diagnosis of ADHD to utilize that resource or 
if someone suspects they may have ADHD, are they able to come in and effectively get tested and potentially be put on those meds? So um, kind of to go back to what I was explaining before, if you've never been officially tested for the ADHD medications, we'd just like you to meet with one of the counselors in Counseling and Prevention Services so they could do some screening tools and talk to you about it. But um, basically, you wouldn't have to have the official diagnosis of ADHD, um, but if they feel like that you would be a good um, person to maybe start those medicines and see if they're working for you, then they would refer you back to student health and we would start those medications. Thank you, Senator Cole. Do you guys have any plans to expand in the near future? Wouldn't that be great? <laughs> I don't know if anybody would be willing to expand us if um, we just got a new building two years ago, but it would be nice if we could. We are currently leasing the Wesley space and using some of our that space for the prevention services. Counseling and prevention services has already outgrown their space upstairs in the second floor. They're using part of that Wesley space and then we use the other part of the Wesley space for our testing services. Thank you. Senator Peng. Hi. So with flu season coming up, you mentioned that flu shots are $25 unless yes. they bring their insurance card. How can students make an appointment for flu shots? So you can walk in for flu shots anytime from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Monday through Friday. Good question. Senator Ballard, Mallard, sorry. So you mentioned how students can get um, like a screening for the ADHD processes to then get the medication. Mm -hmm. If let's say they are approved, and, and I'm assuming this, this isn't like an official like diagnosis, um, and uh, if they then leave the university, is there then like a possibility that you would send all that data to another site that they could then get like an official diagnosis or would they have to go through that whole process again or, you know? <laughs> That's a great question. I would say that if you were to transfer to another facility or medical facility or university, um, you would just ask us for your records and we could supply that to you. I would say most healthcare professionals would go ahead and resume those medications for you based on the fact that you'd already been on them. Um, but there are some universities who are really strict with those stimulants. There's quite a few medications out now that are non-stimulants that are used for prescribing of ADHD medications. So if stimulants um, scare you, there are other options. Um, so a lot of universities are a little more tighter on how they prescribe those medications. We do do um, drug testing when we do stimulants. Um, and it's just one time a year we'll pick to do it. Um, it's part of um, our standard of care, and it's part of most people's standard of care in primary care situations. Thank you. Chairperson Owens? Kind of along the same lines, if you were to graduate from this university and mm -hmm. you were using those kinds of ADHD stimulants, um, would you still be able to get access to refills, or would you need to see a different provider for a different prescription? Good question. So let's say you graduated in May. We would still see you through that following summer up until the first day of fall classes. So we give you a three month buffer. However, when it comes to ADHD medications, the DEA or the department, I uh, don't know what, but the DEA that controls controlled substances will only let us prescribe ADHD medications or stimulants for um, 30 days at a time. Now, you can get a 30-day supply, and then we can give you three prescriptions to start on this date, to this date, this date, to this date, but we can't go beyond that. But yes, there are options. We don't just cut people off on the day of graduation. We give them um, up until the next day of classes in the fall semester. And if you graduate in December, we would give you until the first day of classes in January. Are there any following questions at this time? Yes, Senator Lou. I know last year a topic conversation was like I, this was definitely more on a keyboard level of raising uh, insurance kind of uh, payback, I mean payouts to decrease reliance on student fees. Is there any updates on that on your side? Um, I think that's probably at a level that may be beyond me. Right now, the um, KBOR constituents are trying to decide what insurance plans and what plans and how much they are gonna cost students. Um, and that's usually at a level that I'm not part of. So we, that remains to be seen. 
Thank you. Any other questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you for taking the time to come out tonight. Thank you. Thank I you. left some brochures, chapstick, and student health stickers back there. Awesome. Thank you. At this time, we will exit public forum and move into Section 5, Introductions and Reports. Item 1 of Section 5, Report from the Executive Branch, Chief of Staff Hoops. Sorry. Just kidding. Vice President Thornton. Hello, everyone. Um, I hope everyone is having a wonderful week. Um, the executive branch update is going to be pretty much focused on Diversity Week, um, which has been a huge success so far. Thank you to those who are working on it. Um, today, the Interfest and Dia de los Muertos events had amazing attendance, um, so be sure to check out the ongoing Unity projects outside of the RSC um, for the rest of the week um, and also the rest of the events happening this week. Um, all of those details are on the SGA website at wichita.edu slash SGA Diversity Week. Um, and we hope to see you, all of you at the inaugural Diversity Symposium on Friday, which is going to be pretty awesome. Um, in addition to Diversity Week, um, President Kirk has been meeting with the Graduate Student Council um, and working with them to see how student government can serve that group of students. Um, but yeah, as always, if you have any questions, please reach out to anyone in the executive branch. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you for that report. We will move into item two of section five, report from the Speaker of the Senate. So as many of you may or may not have seen, I sent out a memo, um, I sent it to your email. So please be mindful of that and please read that when you have time. Um, this memo consisted of a couple of different things. So. November 4th will be the last day of any legislation that is submitted to be guaranteed both two reads and sent to a committee. You can still submit legislation after this le deadline. However, November 11th will be the last day to submit any legislation for passage until we reconvene or it will go through um, the legislative process under the Legislative Council. Um, this is also a reminder there will not be a Senate meeting nor any committee meetings on November 30th. Of this, uh, of this month of this year. In place of committee in a Senate meeting, we will have a Senator Social and a Mixer from 5.30 to 8.30 with the Faculty and Staff Senate. Each Senator is required to be in attendance for that um, because that is just taking place in place of a Senate meeting and committee. There will be food provided and Senators are still expected to dress under the regular dress code which is business casual or business professional. If you cannot make it, a Senate excuse must be filled out. And again, the same rules apply 24 hours in advance, please. And if something last minute comes up, it is two hours in advance. If the faculty and staff center are, are unable to make it, we will then have a meet and greet, which will allow students the chance to come and meet those who represent them. However, if the faculty and staff center are able to attend, the meet and greet will then take place sometime at the beginning of the spring semester. For the duration of the rest of the session, as many of you s have seen on the agenda, um, we have decided to add a final roll call to the end of the agenda. This is just to ensure that senators are staying the full duration of the Senate meeting and performing the, du the duties assigned when the oath of office was taken. In place of senators checking in with Clerk Malone for this roll call, a final vote will be taken. So therefore, each senator must uh, push A on their clicker one time at the end of the meeting when invited to. If a senator has to leave early from a, any given meeting, a Senate excuse form must be filled out, please. And lastly, next week after adjourning the meeting, we will be breaking into our caucuses and this will serve solely as a planning session and allow caucuses to select caucus leaders. At this time, I am uh, available for any questions. Seeing none, we will move into item two, sorry, item three, report from the Senate leadership, starting with Chairperson Williams. Thank you. Um, our last event with the Shockers Vote Coalition will be on Tuesday from 10 to 1 on the RSC North Patio. This is our giant Election Day bash where we are celebrating months of hard work um, all of our that all of our volunteers has, have done, as well as celebrating the votes that our students have cast and <clears throat> providing last minute information on how to vote if you haven't already. There will be an interactive art exhibit, free t-shirts, and plenty of fair style food, so make sure you come out and enjoy. I also want to use this time to say a special thank you to all of the international students that have come to our events and supported our work. 
Even though they cannot register to vote or cast a ballot in our elections, they still have shown great interest in our government and express a strong desire to participate in the political processes. Every person is still a vital part of our democracy regardless of whether or not they are qualified to vote. And I am extremely grateful that we have a vibrant international student community that truly does want to make our community a better place for all. So again, thank you. Uh, and lastly, as Speaker Van Dyke Jr. has stated, uh, uh, we're slowly working on the caucuses and we intend on having a framework for caucuses by the end of the semester so we can utilize the spring uh, to trial run all of these ideas before the next uh, session goes full throttle on them. Uh, and with that, I'll sit for any questions. Thank you for that report. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, we will move into a report from Chairperson Okiri. All right, good evening, Senators. I just wanna start out by saying thank you to everyone that has supported Diversity Week this week. Um, we've had so many great events and we are only getting started. Um, if, I, if you haven't yet, and I cannot express this enough, please register for the Diversity Symposium this Friday from 11 to one in the Beggs Ballroom. Um, the DEI committee and I are in pl the planning stage of how we will execute our initiatives for this session, and I am eager to see what they come up with. We have a funding bill coming through the committee for the first reading, and it will be tonight, so I look forward to sharing that with you all. Tonight, Chairperson Lane and I will be discussing more about the resolution we are creating for misgendering and misnaming. I'll stand for questions. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you for that report. Chairperson Owens. Hello everyone, my report is kind of short this week. Um, we're having housing come to our committee yeesh, um, on November 9th, so that's next week. Um, if anyone has anything they want to um, mention to housing or have us mention to them, please let us know. Um, we wanna make sure everyone's concerns are fully re represented with those people. And then we are also having a collaboration with the Academic Affairs Committee to volunteer on November 14th at the Shorker Support Locker at 9 a.m. to 11 a.m. If anyone else wants to come, you're invited to do so. Um, we're going to just be carrying a bunch of food and um, we wanna help support the Shocker Support Locker and I would love to see all of you there. Other than that, we're doing a tour of the dining services on November 19th during our committee time. Um, we're just fully making sure that the dining services is um, being trained properly as well as having labels properly associated with the certain foods and making sure people with allergies are um, properly represented and uh, cared for. Other than that, we're going to do a joint committee with the Diversity, Power, and Inclusion Chair, at, as well as their committee, to talk about international issues. And if anyone wants to join, just let me know. Um, we haven't specifically set a date yet, but when we have, I'll let everyone know, probably during this report. And um, other than that, I did set a time um, to go through different people's committees and um, sit on their committees to further learn how other chairs are meeting and operating their committees, because I, fur I further want to learn um, what it is to be a leader, and I haven't fully, that education never ends, so um, it was very interesting. And um, yeah, that's basically my entire report. Thank you, are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Chairperson Lane. All righty, good evening, Senators. I hope you've all had a wonderful week. My, my report's gonna be a little bit shorter this week, but still not too much shorter. Um, this week I continued work with Speaker Van Dyke to plan the Senator meet and greet and faculty, staff, student, and Senate mixer like we talked about that's gonna be happening on November 30th in place of Senate. And then Academic Affairs also continued work this week on our three main initiatives. So in initiative one, we worked to brainstorm more survey questions to send to first year seminar students to gather feedback 
on seminars and their involvement rates at the university. Uh, our goal is to plan to contact Dr. Rife to administer this survey to more first year seminars to kind of get that more widespread, as well as collaborate with him and faculty general education committee to address gen ed requirements and hopefully, as those are changing, add some requirements that have more student immersion and on campus activities for those first year seminars and those freshmen to get involved with um, Wichita State. Uh, initiative two is working on SBTE resolution. We've been slowly trucking through that one. Um, and I've begun conversations with university agencies to address discrimination in the classroom setting. Initiative three is still working on reviewing academic data from last session, as well as working with academic advisors to establish more career mapping for students and help them understand their major requirements via each college working with that advisor, understanding what the next step is and how they can kind of map out their degree plan. Uh, on top of that, we're also making sure that the degree audit on my WSU is accessible and understandable for students to use, uh, making sure people know how to access it online and all the resources that it has. As well as that, as mentioned by Chairperson Owens, my committee in safety and student services are going to volunteer at the Chakra Support Locker, and I encourage you all to join in if you have the time on November 14th. We would love to have you there. Uh, finally, this week I had more meetings with David Miller to plan budget cycle presentations for y'all and have continued work with DEI Chairperson O'Keary. Um, and Spectrum to address misgendering and incor incorrect pronoun usage in the classroom setting, which we will also address tonight in our committee as a whole. So I hope to hear y'all's feedback. And that's it. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you for that report, Chairperson Harmon. Hello, everyone. Uh, the committee today met with two different student organizations, and they both unanimously passed the committee, so you'll be hearing from them tomorrow, or not tomorrow, next week. Um, and in addition to that, there are three more organizations that are hopefully expected to go through the committee before the end of the semester, so hopefully if we can get everything done in a timely manner, you can see five more organizations before the end of the semester. Uh, other than that, we are still moving forward with our commentary project in the Bill of Rights portion, and we should be finishing that shortly. Um, and today, we also passed legislation to reform the recognition process of the student of, of, of student organizations. So, if there are any questions, I can answer those now. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you for that report. Um, Chairperson Lesnick was not able to join tonight. However, she did say that she is still working remotely and she's available for any appointments virtually if needed. At this time, we will move into Section 4, report from the Senate Advisor, Advisor McLean. Good evening, everybody. So I just have a couple quick things for you all. So um, as a couple of the chairpersons mentioned, um, Chakra Support Locker, for those who are, are interested, because I had a lot of senators after last week's discussion talk about how can I best support the Chakra Support Locker through stocking the locker. So um, as they mentioned, on November 14th, um, through from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., we'll all be at Grace Wilkie um, sort of stocking the locker. It'll be a team of half of our staff in SEAL, um, and as many of you all who want to show up as possible, um, it'll be a great time. Um, I think we're going to do some marketing things. That way we can sort of like do a time lapse of it, because it's really cool to see, like, when it's empty at first, and then you throw in a few thousand dollars worth of food. It's, it's a really pretty sight, and I can't wait to see the time lapse. Um, and then at the same time, um, as uh, both the speaker and the, and the pro temp mentioned, um, be sort of be thinking about some things that which within your caucuses you all can be working on. Um, obviously, as we have conversations within your committees um, and with students, there's also things of which they have come up about, um, but if it's anything specifically about your caucus of which you wish to address, just be in preparation for those conversations. Um, and then at the same time, for even if you're a senator that doesn't correspond directly to a caucus, so my underserved, my international graduate, um, all those senators as well, if, if there's anything of which within your constituency groups um, that you would like to tackle, please um, have those conversations conversations amongst each other. That way you all can be prepared to do so uh, when the semester turns over. And then last uh, point I wanted to mention, just in preparation, um, I will be sending out a sort of a satisfaction survey to everyone, hopefully by the end of the semester. I'm finishing it up um, as we speak. Um, so hopefully within the next week or two, you will all receive a survey. It's sort of to talk about, um, A, how am I doing as an advisor? How's uh, Advisor Fonseca doing as an advisor? How can we best support you all? But at the same time, how can Senate leadership um, support you all? And how you all can best support each other um, as we look to close out the session? Okay, I stand for any questions. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time? 
Seeing none, thank you for the report. Thank you. We will now hear from the report from the association advisor under item five, advisor Fonseca. I have nothing to share this week. Do you want questions about that? Sure. Okay, just kidding. <laughs> thank you for that report. Um, we will move into section six, approval of the consent agenda. At this time, are there any objections to the consent agenda? Seeing none, the consent agenda is adopted as such. At this time, we will move into section seven, seven consideration of pending business. Item one, the clerk will read. Act on request to approve SB-65-076, the Legislative Process Act. So at this time, we have heard from the author and we have asked questions. So at this time, we will move into the debate period. Is there anybody who would like to speak in affirmation or negation of this bill? Yes, Senator Barlow. I would like to speak in negation of this bill. Uh, the, the core of the complaints about consent agenda and funding bills related to receiving presentations from budget and finance, which is within the original rules of the primary concern is following what's written. Once we've seen whether or not the written system is working, then I think it becomes relevant to talk about changing those rules. Right now, we haven't seen the process working as intended. Last week was a step in the right direction. I think we're almost there. But yeah, I don't know if we should be uh, blanket rewriting how we operate at this time. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during this debate period? Senator Unruh? Yes, I don't think that just because there are potentially other issues with the bylaws or because some elements of the bylaws aren't operating the way you might want it to, um, that would be a reason to want to change part of the bylaws, to not keep it the same way. I think this bill is a really good idea. Um, it allows us to have more talk about legislation before it gets to committee. It encourages senators to be more involved in the process. I think as a senator, something that's been, I wouldn't really say concerning, but kind of a little bit disorienting is that so much of the process of legislation is done by leadership without being in front of the Senate. So I think not only will this uh, allow more senators to be involved in what we're discussing and to be able to help be a big role in creating that legislation, but it also will kind of open the, open the doors for people to be more open in terms of um, not only transparency, but also knowing how this legislation gets made and being more tr uh, focused on creating more stuff in the future. Um, so overall, I think this is a really positive change and I really hope we vote in favor of this legislation. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in? Senator Victoria Owens. Hey folks, um, I think we all know why this legislation is coming about and I think in a lot of ways it's um, a nice gesture. Um, however, it's just contradictory. Uh, it states that after the first read, the Speaker of the Senate shall assign the legislation to a committee and then in point G contradicts itself and says that the bill shall not be assigned to a committee after the first read. Uh, just plainly contradictory and also as previous senators stated, I don't think it's necessary. Uh, I think as long as we're receiving accurate accounts of what what's happening in each committee, I think that's good enough. And I think this is just a step in a direction where we don't need to go. So. Thank you, Chairperson Williams. Thank you. Uh, as stated last week when uh, the bill was introduced, as Senator Unruh has stated, it just seeks to increase discussion around the legislation that we propose, that we introduce. It keeps it in front of the student body, so that way we are held accountable for our actions, and the process challenges us as a body to have conversations about issues sooner and longer, creating more effective solutions and allowing us to get work done. Um, I would also caution that this bill does not change anything about the funding process at all, that by enacting this change now, it doesn't affect how we are looking at the financial process. It doesn't change any potential future uh, change to the financial process. This is completely separate. Um, and I, I don't quite see how um, one will impact the other at the current moment. Um, and I would also explain that it, it, subpoint G in and of itself is not necessarily contradictory. Further on in the bylaws, it specifically states that funding bills and registered student organization bills are automatically sent to committee in the first place. 
if Clause G was not inserted, uh, that would mean that these organizations that need funding or recognition would have to go through uh, committee first, then to the Senate, then to committee second, uh, and then back to the Senate. So this process actually, so Clause G will actually simplify that process. It doesn't contradict, it supplements and supports. Um, with that being said, I will also say that there was a concern last week over the right of the Senate to bring bills to the floor themselves without being reported out of committee or if they were failed out of committee. And so at this point, I will move to amend section E to now read, such legislation shall be placed on the agenda for the next Senate meeting under unfinished business after being reported out of the assigned committee or by a two thirds vote of the Senate. Is there a second? Senator Ava, I saw your hand. Um, so would you like to speak any further on that? Before we do that, could yes. you say that one more time so I can amend the bill? Yes, on section, subsection E, um, just append on the end or by a two thirds vote of the Senate. Thank you. At this time, is there anybody who would like to speak in debate, um, either in affirmation or negation of this amendment? Senator Ava? I think it's uh, the two thirds is a good way to add it in. I don't think there's any harm in it. So I think, yeah, I think it's a good idea to amend that. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during this debate period? And just to be clear, we're speaking on amending subsection E of this bill. Seeing none, we'll move into the voting period. Um, for all senators, please remember to turn your clicker on. You're gonna click the power button and you're gonna click AA to sign in. And then from there, A is yes, we would like to amend. B is no and C is abstain. And the voting period is now open. With 34 yes, one no, and three abstentions, the motion passes. All right, and at this time we will enter back into the debate period over the bill as a whole, the Legislative Process Act. Is there anybody who would like to speak in affirmation or negation, Senator Barlow? So I would like to clarify here that uh, up until last week, every single funding bill that we saw here was moving through on the consent agenda. It was not being procured as a report for us to hear. So from my perspective, last week was the first opportunity anyone in this session has had to actually look at how our rules stipulate we review funding uh, appropriations. I think that's a great step. I don't think it's necessary at this time to start changing how all of this works underneath the hood. I think we need to have more experience as a session receiving reports and budget and finance as the way it's written to get a better baseline for what changes might need to be made. I think it's too soon right now to be making those wild changes. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak? Senator uh, Harmon? I would like to clarify some of the concerns raised about the process of the budget and finance bills. Section, uh, uh, sorry, subpoint G uh, specifically states that funding bills and RSO bills are not uh, being changed in this uh, bill. So the process that we've been talking about with uh, funding bills and how we want that changed or improved or done correctly, this bill has nothing to do with that. This is simply changing the process of legislation overall and specifically saying that we're not going to change the funding bill process yet or student organization process yet. That would be done through other bills. This bill has nothing to do with that process. I would just like to clarify that. Is there anybody? Thank you, Senator Bastian. Um, I'm speaking in negation because this new bill would be wasting time and we'd be discussing bills before they are properly written or clarified. And then how many times do we go over the revisions before um, it's presented to Senate? Like, does the committee sit and work on them till they're possible? Or does the Senate constantly keep saying, we're not satisfied with this, please make revisions? It's better to have a committee give you a final um, version of the document, and then we say yes, no, and fail it as a whole, rather than us having to go over it multiple times and then see, and basically do the drafting process as an entire Senate. 
Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like, uh, Advisor McLean? I just wanted to just make this quick point. Not every piece of legislation has to come out of committee. That's in, in sort of the conversations with Senator leadership, that's the purpose of this legislation. Um, there's been plenty of conversations where I've had instances where you all mentioned something that's completely outside of the realm of your committees. So at, what this legislation is in a sense doing is eliminating the barrier of, oh, I need to come up with this legislation, then I need to go to committee, and then I need to go to the floor, and then I need to go back to the floor. In a sense, if an individual senator wanted to propose legislation, you just send it over to, to Clerk Malone and, and Speaker Van Dyke, and then you're, you're off and rocking, and then it goes to the committee. So in a sense, if a committee is working on stuff, yes, in a sense, it does add an additional week, um, but if an individual senator wants to propose legislation and have that go through the process, it's much easier to do that versus finding a committee to get that to approve through. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during this debate period? Senator Alva? Uh, I don't think that one week is such a big deal where we have to argue that much on it. I think this allows an easier process for individual senators to bring up legislation, and I think it's a good idea to bring it to the floor, let people like at least let, hear it, and then allow the speaker to just give it to a committee. I think this makes it actually a smoother process and one that brings about more discussion. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during this debate period? Senator Owens? More of a point of information to Pro Temp Williams, um, the creator of this. How would co-sponsors work if we're first bringing this up during Senate? It doesn't necessarily like change anything. Co-sponsors can be added on or subtracted by the author at any point in time. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in uh, this debate period. Seeing none, we will go into a voting period. And to be clear, we're voting on the bill as a whole. A is yes to um, accept, uh, prove this. B is no, and C is abstain, and the voting period is now open. With 28 yes, 8 no, and 3 abstentions, the bill passes. Thank you. At this, uh, at this time, we will exit Section 7 and move into Section 8, consideration of new business. Item 1 under Section 8, the clerk will read. Act on request to approve AR-65-005, Election Day Holiday Act. Thank you. Is the author here and wish to speak? The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Uh, I want to keep this short with you. Uh, really, a non-instructional day would help uh, to give students a chance to go out and vote without having to skip any classes for that day. Uh, often students don't vote because they say they're too busy and other universities have implemented this non-instructional day, such as Columbia University, Princeton University, Brown University, George Washington University, American University, the University of Utah, and Colorado College. Uh, so again, this uh, would encourage students to get out, vote, and further participate in our elections. Uh, I stand for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time, Senator Bastian? What about mail-in ballots? Because I could do that at any time in the night as well. Like, why would I go queue up to vote if I could just mail in my vote? This gives you some more flexibility for that. So, of course, you still can early vote, mail-in vote, whatever you want to do. Uh, but also, it just gives students the opportunity to go vote uh, on voting day. Thank you. Are there any further questions at this time, Senator Liu? Have you <clears throat> talked to any faculty or staff about how it might impact the academic calendar? I haven't talked to any faculty or staff per se, but it, I mean, you got to think about it. I mean, it's, it's one day. Um, so I believe that 
most faculty and staff would be open to the idea of moving things around to provide students this opportunity. Advisor Fonseca. Um, a similar resolution was adopted last session, um, and we've had those conversations with the administration, the SGA's administration last year, and we have that information, but with resolutions, they expire at the end of every session, and so for the executive branch to continue pursuing this, um, then a resolution would need to be adopted to redirect the executive branch to focus on that. So we have all the information and answers to that question. Um, honestly, for those who were here last year, it was mixed review and mixed support. Um, I think the staff side was much more supportive than the faculty side, keeping in mind, yes, because faculty want as many class days as possible. Um, but there are um, options and um, alternatives that were brought up last year, um, even directly with the Kansas Board of Regents who adopts the academic calendar for each institution um, to, in, to consider something like this. And so um, to that question, Senator, I would say we have that information um, just in order for us to continue working on it or for the executive branch to continue focusing on it, then another resolution would need to be supported to say that this session also wants us to continue doing that work. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Senator Atkinson. Atkinson. Um, what are current Kansas laws on having universities as polling places? I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not really sure. But Advisor Fonseca. Kansas laws that have universities serve as polling places? So Wichita State is a polling place. Um, so we are zoned um, for the area, keeping in mind the issue that we are still working on with the county office, because zoning or um, uh, polls are set by the county, not by the state. Um, and so Wichita State is a zoning, is a poll place for voting day for both primary and general election. So next week, the uh, Marcus Welcome Center will be the polling place for this, um, I think the word district. Yeah, for this area, district, yeah. Um, we are continuing to work with the county office to bring early voting back to campus so that anyone in the county um, who is nearby Wichita State can vote. If you're a student here and, and you can vote in Kansas, or sorry, if you can vote in the county, um, and trying to make campus um, a voting poll as well. So we were already a voting poll for the general and primary, unfortunately only for those who, are, who live within this area who are assigned to this voting poll which is about, I think, 5,000 voters. And as a follow-up to that, it allows students who are outside the county to maybe be able to drive home and vote in person, like I said. Thank you, Senator Barlow. Would this have any effect on students who work on campus? Would they get their shift off to get to the vote? So it is just a non-instructional day. It is not a, uh, I can't, think of the alternative right now but uh, essentially all staff is going to have to be here but it just means that no classes will be be taken that day so uh, students would still have to get out their work things but uh, as far as classes go they'd be free from that thank you Senator Lou have you talked to the executive branch about how they would pursue this and what they might do for this resolution so Essentially, if I have my facts straight, this would more of just be uh, an initiative that the executive branch would just be talking to the to KBOR about. Uh, pretty much just making sure that they know that we're interested in this kind of a day, and then KBOR would set our our schedules accordingly if they agree with our stance. Senator Howard. There it is, sorry. <laughs> so if this bill were to pass, how quickly would this go into effect? Like, would we be able to have this go into effect by the November 8th election? Uh, no, so this would not be for this year. It would probably be for either, uh, it'd probably be for the next election cycle. Uh, but I'll yield the floor. Uh, so the academic calendars are approved two years out. Um, so, but the process, of changing it is a lengthy one. Um, so we're at the right time for us to begin the conversations with uh, the university and the regents for them to consider it uh, because they adopt the academic calendar so early. Um, they're, I think, beginning conversations of the 2025-2026 academic year 
and 26, 27 academic year now. And so just knowing that it is about two years out, so if this were to adopt, and for if the regents were to accept and say, yes, this is what we want, the regents could also say, you're changing the calendar for next year, right? It's impossible for us to do it for next week, uh, but they could say, we're gonna make the change for next year and just bring that calendar back and make the adjustment. Um, but this would be the timing in order for our, the, the process with the regents to begin. Are there any other, Senator Owens? This is probably a question for Advisor Fonseca, but is there a way to permanently ensure that Election Day is a holiday um, instead of having to re-vote um, on this every year? So I think that's what this is attempting to do, is to make it permanent. I think we are having to vote on it every year simply because it hasn't, it wasn't done and it wasn't accomplished last session. And in order for them to move it into a list of priorities, the resolution has to be adopted. If the executive branch and the student government was lucky, and lucky is a strong word, but if we were successful in the endeavor of making this permanent, then it would just become a permanent thing on the calendar and we wouldn't have to theoretically redo this every single year. But I think the practice of redoing it emphasizes the Senate's um, desire that the executive branch focus on this um, to get it done or attempt to get it done. Senator Atkinson. Um, I must note that as a state senator, um, one day for those who wish to go home and vote is not always uh, operable. So would it not be possible to move fall break back, da back to election weekend? I mean, I, I think really that's a different question entirely. I mean, for out-of-state voters, there are different options. I mean, as there are for in-state people. Uh, but I would say that, I mean, as we can see, uh, people are being strenuous with even giving us one extra day, right? So um, I think that just allowing us to have a little bit more leeway for in-state voters and people who are, have a little bit shorter of a distance to go uh, just gives them some more opportunities while people who are out of state and a little further away still have their other avenues of voting. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you for taking the time. We will now move into the debate period. Is there anybody who would like to speak in affirmation or negation of this bill? S Senator Ava. I think this is a good step. Uh, affirmation, I think this is a good step. My opinion, I feel like election, like election day should always have a, the best avenue for people to go out and vote. I get that there is mail-in ballots, advanced ballots, but some people actually wanna go people that can want to go and actually vote at their voting place, no matter where it is, giving people that opportunity to and time to plan around it is the best way, because it's not going to be this one. But if people know, teachers will be able to plan around it. Everyone will be able to plan around it if there's enough time. So I think giving just students the opportunity to be able to vote when they can, and anyone else on a non-instructional day is the best way to do it. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during this debate, Senator Herr? I would also like to speak in affirmation. I know that there's kind of an issue with our generation and not wanting to vote or not being educated on voting. So I think that having the day off of school and having some extra time could possibly encourage students to vote um, or at least look into voting. So I will be speaking in affirmation. Thank you. Senator uh, Grimes. Yeah, I'll be supporting this bill because I support my fellow students in their right to vote. Um, it allows for students to exercise their constitutional responsibility of participating in our elections, and voting is what allows for change in our government. Um, and students must have their opinions heard, and this bill does just that. Um, so I encourage other senators to support this as well. Thank you. Is there anybody who would like to speak in negation of this bill? Seeing none, I will close the debate period, and we'll move into the voting period. Um, remember, A is yes to approve this bill, B is no, and C is abstain, and the voting is now open. With 38 yes, zero no, and zero abstentions, the motion passes.
Congratulations. We will now move into item two under section eight. The clerk will read. Act on request to approve AR-65-006, and forgive me if I say this wrong, concerning the use of polystyrene foam. Thank you. Is the author here and wish to speak? The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Alice. I'm the Director of Sustainability. My name is Jay. I'm the Director of Policy and Legislative Affairs. And we are here to introduce to you um, the association resolution concerning the use of polystyrene foam. Um, this resolution has the intent of banning the purchase and use of styrofoam on campus. Um, and to establish a task force of representatives from departments across campus to create a plan to phase out styrofoam by the end of spring 2023. Um, so we decided to pursue this initiative because um, styrofoam demonstrates health risks to students. Uh, components of styrofoam are human carcinogens and defined as uh, hazardous waste by the CDC. Um, and because styrofoam can cause, among other symptoms, gastrointestinal troubles, headaches, etc. Um, and because the creation of air and water pollutants during the production and disposal of the styrofoam. Um, and so we'd like to encourage the university to switch to some of the widely available alternatives. For example, biodegradable packaging, um, PLA-lined paper, molded fiber, and uh, mineral-filled polypropylene. Awesome, thank you. At this time, are there any questions? Senator Harmon. So polystyrene products are commonly found in many appliances, including refrigerators, air conditioners, ovens, microwaves, vacuum cleaners, blenders, the installation of walls and buildings, many car parts, and many electronics. In the seventh, whereas the resolution states that alternatives to polystyrene products are widely available, so have the authors of this resolution checked to see if these appliances at the university are polystyrene free and are they prepared to replace even things such as the walls of the universities? So uh, the styrofoam reference guide which accompanies this association resolution I don't believe was included in the legislative packet. However, um, if you have had access to the styrofoam reference guide, it does say that um, when we reference styrofoam or polystyrene, we're specifically referencing expanded polystyrene foam, which is commonly known as styrofoam or polystyrene. Po uh, styrofoam specifically is an insulation that was used in houses in the 1930s um, and is not in any of your food products today, but that's what we all know it as. Um, so we are specifically talking about the use of styrofoam with food handling, because that's where the hazard um, relates to students. Thank you, Senator Wing. Uh, you mentioned the alternatives, sorry, over here. Uh, you mentioned the alternatives to the styrofoam. How difficult would it be to implement the alternatives? So for example, like costs, um, the workers knowing what to do and stuff like that. Right, so I mean, we've all had um, interactions with, with items that function in the same way as styrofoam, but are not styrofoam. Um, and we've had conversations with many people on campus. Um, we've had conversations with Kevin Conda, because a lot of this relates to the functioning of the Radigan Student Center. Um, and he has explained to us that it's not a huge cost. It's not gonna be a change in terms of any like processes other than purchasing will change. Um, and the rest of the plan will be defined by the task force. So for all of those other little details, I can't um, specifically say at this point, but. Senator Howard. So within enforcement of this plan, um, what kinds of punishments could be in place for a student organization that doesn't follow this? Would they be on like probation or? So this doesn't relate at all to student organizations. This is just um, the purchasing of it by um, our purchasing department on campus. So this has nothing to do with student organizations or student fees services. 
anything relating to like students own purchasing. Um, this is really just for our purchasing office to have kind of a, an extra level of, or I, I guess a standard to set for them that they wouldn't buy um, styrofoam. Uh, helpful clarification with that question that uh, specifically today we're referencing the association resolution. Uh, I think that question is directed towards the associated bills, right? Okay. And senators, please be, please be mindful that the um, reference guide that was mentioned is in the Teams folder. So if you need to look at the reference guide, it is in the Teams folder for today. Senator Unruh. So because there's been a lot of confusion over what specific uses of styrofoam you're trying to regulate, can you give some examples of the most common use of styrofoam that you want to try to avoid on campus? Yeah, absolutely. So um, styrofoam cups, if you see any of the styrofoam cups, uh, they, they're, I think, Freddy's still, Chick-fil-A, I'm not sure if they've changed yet. Um, the other big use of styrofoam would be those clamshell containers. Um, they switched to them. They were originally using a biodegradable container in the Breakfast & Co. establishment. They switched to styrofoam. Um, so that would be an example of that. The Shocker Grill and Lanes was using styrofoam clamshells a lot. Um, oh, yeah, Panda Express. They have some other alternatives that, sorry, if you ask, they will um, change it sometimes. But, um, but yeah, Panda Express also uses the clamshell. Thank you. Senator Harmon. So you said that this resolution is specifically targeting uh, expanded styrofoam and specifically in food handling, but why does it not specify that in the, uh, especially in the first resolve where it says that the executive branch of the association shall provide, oh sorry, that's the wrong one. The resolve is that the association hereby calls for a ban on the purchase or use of styrofoam or other polystyrene products throughout Wichita State University and campuses, because that is a very broad statement. Right, so I was advised not to get into the nitty gritty details um, and to kind of call things by their common names or what um, people would commonly refer to them as, so. Did you have a follow up? Yeah. Go ahead. So um, you're, you're saying you mean it in a specific way but did not state that in the resolution. Right, it's in the reference guide. And it, I mean the reference guide will be given to the, the task force that is tasked with fixing this, so. Are there any further questions at this time for this resolution? Seeing none, thank you for taking the time to present. At this time, we will move into the debate period. You can stay or leave for debate. Thank okay. you. I just wanted to say thank you. Thank you. Um, is there anybody who would like to speak in affirmation or negation of this uh, resolution? Senator Harmon. So I will be speaking in negation of this resolution. Um, I believe that the uh, resolution has a lot of good intentions, but I also believe that it's just too broad of a resolution to say that the university should ban all uses of polystyrene, because polystyrene is used so commonly in many very common appliances. There's a microwave in the ROC. I don't know if it's been checked to see if it has polystyrene in it. There's a refrigerator in the student government office. Polystyrene is used in refrigerators. It might be in that. It's just too broad of a statement, and so I'll be voting in negation of that. Thank you, Senator Owens. Hi, um, I'll be voting in favor, uh, primarily because I believe it is our responsibility um, to ensure that the university is protecting our students and also just doing good practices by, you know, not using harmful styrofoam. Um, but also in general, from previous concerns, I think that there's an obvious usage for this uh, resolution that does not um, encompass other uses of polystyrene, uh, just the styrofoam when it comes to food handling. And I think we, most of us, um, and almost all of us understand where they're coming from with this resolution. I mean, when you go to Shocker Grill and Lanes or you go get food at the RSC and they hand you this uh, styrofoam packaging, that's obviously what they're trying to limit and stop. Um, Obviously, it's not encompassing any other uh, fridges or microwaves. Like, obviously, it's not trying to get rid of that. So I just think, in reality, it's a good step forward. Um, yeah, that's all. Thank you. Is uh, Senator Warden? <laughs> 
Hi. Um, so I just want to clarify what Alice was trying to say. Polystyrene foam. It's non bio, it's non biodegradable. It's it even if we're in the Midwest, it's going to get to our ocean somehow. It's toxic for the wildlife. It's toxic for us. Mentioning how it's a broad term, I feel like is not concise with what she has written in this legislation because she thoroughly has stated multiple times. It is with food handling, it is with cups, clamshells, things that are being bought that are one-time uses that are non-recyclable. I think this is a good start because many other colleges have started banning polystyrene foam. Different types of states have done it starting from 2019, um, especially in Maine, Maryland, New York City, Los Angeles County, Seattle, Washington DC, San Francisco. And I feel like it's a great start, so I'm going to be voting in favor. Thank you, Senator Liu. I think uh, at the end of the day, this uh, resolution isn't saying like we're going to stop all cyber foam. It's saying we're going to have a task force for it. So, and furthermore, um, I think it can be implied that no one is trying to replace walls and stuff. So, and for and the staff and members of the staff have already said they are planning on phasing out styrofoam by the end of the semester, so this resolution seems like a logical next step. Thank you, Senator Beshin. Um, so I'm speaking in negation. Um, I'd like to start by saying all plastic is bad, irrespective of styrofoam, single use, multiple use, et cetera. But the reason why I don't support this is one, it is out of the scope of our control. The, the restaurants, the dining halls, all the places that offer styrofoam is not being paid by the SGA. So how are you going to stop them or convince them otherwise just by saying, oh, we ban it, but we have absolutely no way of holding them accountable. The second thing is um, there are no incentives or rewards to move in another direction except saying that um, you're go it's harmful to our health. I'm a college student. I personally say I wish I was dead multiple times. Like, the styrofoam package doesn't really make that much of a difference in my life at this point. I've eaten out of plastic for the past 26 years. I'm going to do the same going forward. One tiny thing that doesn't have a, a decent enough impact um, or a long-term impact is almost as good as doing nothing. Um, and then finally, this is not enforceable. How are you going to penalize your students for carrying styrofoam? You might say just the RSOs, but individually, how are you going to stop them? I have a single-use plastic cup on my desk right now. Tomorrow, this could be styrofoam because I got it from outside. What are you going to say then? So yes, we have a task force. Yes, we say that we want to ban all of this. But it's also equally important to have a long-term plan that doesn't just stop at styrofoam. If you're going to plan ban plastics, think about the long term. Think about all single uses. Think about moving in a direction that we can add towards um, the future. So if we're going to do something this small, I want it to be more impactful. And right now, this legislation is not there. Thank you. Senator Shea? I would also like to speak an affirmation for this. Um, I believe that if there is any threats posed by using styro like polystyrene or whatever, that we should be doing something about it to protect the students here. And while some of us may not, I do value my life. So I would like to like make a movement towards that. And as you speak of taking a step um, to for the long run of like getting rid of plastics or something like that, well, this is a step. If you don't look at it that way, I mean, some of us might. Thank you, Senator Fleer. Um, yeah, so um, I kind of want to stem off of what was just said. Um, I think that I value my life, but I also value others' lives as well, and I think that that is the exact uh, movement of sustainability, is trying to make that our uh, world is a better place for everyone. Um, and then I also wanted to point out the fact that this bill uh, says that the student Government Association hereby suggests the university to ban it. Um, that is where, um, that is something that I just see as like a very important word in this uh, bill um, that um, we are not banning it, we are suggesting it, and that is how it will be dealt with. Thank you. Thank you. I have heard a number of 
Uh, Senator speaking in affirmation at this time. Is there anybody speaking in negation of the bill? Senator Harmon. So I'd like to read that resolve that was just mentioned. Uh, Therefore, be it resolved that the association hereby calls for a ban on the purchase and use of styrofoam and other polystyrene products, emphasizing or other polystyrene products throughout Wichita State University and campuses. While I appreciate the clarification of the author's intent of this resolution, that is not what is stated. The resolution states that it's calling for a ban of not just styrofoam or expanded polystyrene, it is also calling for a ban on other polystyrene products throughout Wichita State University and its campuses. So I just cannot in good conscience vote in favor of something so broad that it could ban parts of cars that also use polystyrene. Uh, The insulation of buildings uses polystyrene oftentimes. Uh, Refrigerators, microwaves, blenders, various things use polystyrene products. And as the way this resolution reads, it's calling for a ban of those products as well. So I cannot in good conscience vote in favor of this resolution. Thank you. At this time, I will allow for one more affirmation. Senator Unruh. Yeah, so I think a lot of the concerns, which I think are valid on the part of the people who are speaking in the nation, I think would be better addressed to the, you know, I think upcoming association bill on the topic. This is just pushing for these, um, you know, institutions and organizations to push to remove styrofoam. It's not actually enforcing a ban, which when you try to get into the specific, you know, how broad it is, it's not requiring anyone remove all of their fridges. So even if there is a valid complaint, I think the fact that we attach the um, we attach the reference guide to styrofoam, we're clearly talking about these these cups and these styrofoam containers. I think it's fairly obvious in a resolution sense what we're trying to get them to do, and I think in that sense it's a positive move. But then when you start going into the bill stuff and you start talking about enforcement, I think these are all valid complaints. That's just not what this resolution is trying to do. I think the idea of creating a task force, of pushing for this um, moving away from styrofoam, I think is pretty... Um, most of us, I think, have all agreed this is a good idea, and that's what this resolution is trying to do. It's not enforcing or, or banning anything, per se. Thank you. Before I close the debate, is there anyone who would like to speak in negation? Seeing none, I will close the debate at this time. We're moving to the voting period. A is yes to approve this resolution. B is no. C is abstain. And the voting is open. With 24 yes, 11 no, and three abstentions, the motion passes. Congratulations. At this time, we move to item three under section eight. The clerk will read. Act on request to approve SB-65-063, funding request for the Dirksen Amphitheater mural. Is the author here and wish to speak? The floor is yours. Hello, everyone. Um, Okay, so today, Christian Beal from Stratcom and Armando Minjereres, formerly an Office of Diversity and Inclusion Coordinator, are here to present the Adelante Juntos, or Forward Together, a proposal for partnership from the association on a Dirksen Amphitheater mural. And by the way, the proposal is under the legislative packet, so pull that up, so. But I welcome them to the floor. Hello, I'm Kristen Beal. I am in the Office of Strategic Communications. And Armando and I began working on this proposal maybe 18 months ago when Armando was still here at the university in the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So I assume, so we're not gonna put it up on the screen or is it all on your screens already? Okay, okay. Um, So I'm really going to hand this over to Armando and let him talk about it. It is tied to a project that he did in Wichita starting in 
17 called Horizontes. So he's going to give you some um, history on that project and how it will link to this project on campus. And I just want to say we, this project is funded, it's supported, and it's moving forward. We're here to ask for your partnership. We really want to have the, the students involved and have student government involved in the process. So here's Armando. Good evening, everyone. How are you? Good to be back in this microphone. Old memories. Okay, let me tell you a little bit of background about the Project Horizontes. Um, in my role as an artist and community organizer here in Wichita, uh, we, in 2017, I developed the Project Horizontes, which uh, one of the, um, the main pieces from that community art project is a large uh, grain elevator mural that we painted. Uh, if you go up to the parking garage, to the top floor, you can see it from there. You can go to uh, McKnight and see it also from the second and third floor. Uh, it's that large. And the, the Grand Elevator mural sits between two historic neighborhoods in North Wichita. Uh, what it's one, the North End, historically uh, Mexican-American and immigrant neighborhood in Northeast Wichita, which the university sits on, which has been historically um, primarily an African-American community. Uh, that project, Horizontes, focused on creating a space for solidarity among those two communities, um, really to create a, a process for people to find belonging and to express their opinions about how they wanted their community to, to be changed as investment was being uh, rolled into those two um, neighborhoods. Uh, how this relates to Wichita State. Um, as you know, the university sits on a neighborhood that the university has basically relegated since the inception of the university, right, with the African-American community here. And um, since the university has started a lot of efforts to engage the residents of Northeast Wichita, uh, in addition to um, really ramping up the efforts to recruit um, Hispanic, uh, and Latinx students uh, onto campus. Um, at some point, they were talking about becoming an HSI, uh, for which is the state to become an HSI. So that was the, the conversations that were happening when this project came about. We look for uh, different um, areas in the university where we could have the spirit of Horizontes on campus to, to paint a mural that was designed and created by the same artist, Gleo, who painted the large Grand Elevator mural. Uh, since we have identified a location for the mural, like Kristen said, funding has been uh, secured and um, we are now moving into the production process. Uh, we reached out to SGA a few months ago because we wanted to ensure that, that we really want SGA to be um, a part of this project and provide some of the, the funding. Um, and so we're here today to tell you more about it and to answer any questions. Uh, one of the main goals for this project is not just to have a pretty piece of artwork on campus, but really to use it as an opportunity to continue to create a space for belonging uh, for students, racialized students on campus, and for everyone else, right, that, that is enrolled at the university to activate an area on campus that has been also pretty dilapidated and underutilized for a long time, and, um, and to take advantage of some investments that is already going into that space as they are um, updating the lighting and the sound equipment and potentially in the future, also some additional seating and landscaping. So this is really kind of taking uh, advantage of the, the investment that is already going on into that space. Um, I don't know if there is anything that I missed I don't think about so. the proposal. Um, There's uh, programming through ODI. When Armando was still in ODI, he developed this framework of empowerment, representation, and community pride. And so there's already um, resources put towards this framework within ODI, and that is the framework that will be um, you know, utilized in programming on the site. 
And as he said, there's already um, investment on the site. They ha and it's it's already done. The lighting and the the sound um, on the, has been replaced at the Dirksen Amphitheater. And we are leveraging that and this mural to have um, new landscaping plans developed for the site. But that would be a fundraising project that would go through the WSU Foundation. So, yeah, I think that is everything. We can open it up for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions at this time? Senator Mallard. <coughs> Sorry. Um, I was reading over the why now thing and it states uh, if uh, it, it, it states that you'll approach the Ulrich Museum to have it become a sculpture a sculpture and I think that's a great idea but then it states if they decline the mural can be simply painted over once it shows wear, wear, wear and tear is that stating that like let's say in like five ten years if it's like chipping a lot that they're just gonna paint it white or is there hopes to like repair it every so often because if so I think that'd be yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, the simple answer is that we don't know, right? We approached the, the Old Ridge and they were interested in, in the partnership. The idea to, to have it added to the Old Ridge collection, it's that then they're responsible for the upkeep of the mural. Uh, since I have changed leadership and they're kind of going through the transition period right now, so that's a conversation that we'll pick up again uh, in the next few months. Um, the other option, if for some reason the Old Ridge is not, no longer wants to do that, then, you know, it's a mural, it has a, um, a shelf life. Um, typically with the paint that we've used uh, before is high quality paint that is guaranteed for at least 10 years. Um, the mural can be um, fixed if there's any wear and tear or it can be replaced by another piece of art. Uh, but that's kind of far in the future. Ideally, we would want the Ulrich to add it to their collection to ensure that, that, they're, that there'll be upkeep and the, you know, in the next years, but that's something that it's still in process. Yeah. Thank you, Senator Barlow. I know in your uh, PDF file here, you're talking about College of Fine Arts leadership replacing different theater specific uh, lighting and sound specifically. Have you spoken to fine arts educators, faculty about the mural itself? And if so, what's been the feedback you've gotten from them? Uh, yes. R Dr. Rodney Miller and the directors of the different schools within the College of Fine Arts have been involved in this process since the beginning and they approve it, gave it the thumbs up to move forward, so. Thank you, are there any further questions? Senator Liu. I noticed the projected cost was uh, something like 40,000 and you said there's partnerships with the Ulrich ODI and College of Fine Arts. Um, how do you come up with the 15,000 requests from SGA and how much are each of those respective partnerships contributing? There is no um, f partnership with the College of Fine Arts in terms of a financial partnership. Um, the 15,000 that was, has, was come up with is for production costs and that is the um, committee the Diversity Engagement and Inclusion Committee um, made that proposal last week for that to be their contribution. Right, so production costs, again, that'll be paints, equipment, rental, um, et cetera. Mr. Speaker, I would, I would come up here um, so that if questions come up specifically about DEI's recommendation that you take those answer, those questions um, since it was your committee who made those recommendations. So if any future questions specifically about the recommendation should be answered by Iris. Uh, Chairperson Okir, chair. oh, you're fine, thank you. Chairperson Okir, did you have any follow-up to that question? Okay, at this time, are there any other questions? Uh, sorry, Chairperson Williams. Uh, so this would be directed to Chairperson O'Keary or the advisors. As it stands, the bill just provides funding to uh, the project. Would it be within the Senate's authority to specifically earmark them for certain parts of the project? Hold on one second.
we're ready. All right. Um, so, in the long answer, no. Um, but in the short answer, we can make a strong recommendation um, that with the $15,000, it can go to strictly to production costs. But at the end of the day, we can't necessarily stip stim or stipulate that the funds can only be used for such things. Thank you, Senator Barlow. What happens if we do not allocate this $15,000? What's your next move? Well, the project will move ahead. Um, as I said, funding has been identified. Um, it will be, you know, the benefit of having student government involved is that you're all students in your students at this university and representatives of the student body of this university. And so getting student involvement into the mural, if you look at the um, the Horizontes mural, all of the people that are represented on that mural are people that um, were either um, his, uh, given to her, the artist in photographs of um, people that represented the neighborhoods, or some of them are, um, you know, artists or people in, living in the neighborhood today. And one of the people on that mural is actually a, was a student at Wichita State. So she will, you know, her process is such that she really likes to um, engage herself with the community and build relationships. And then those are the people that end up in the represented on the mural, her, her work. If I could just expand on that, if we look at the, um, the middle uh, mosaic mural on the Old Ridge, that's one project that was um, partly funded by the Student Government Association, right? So part of it is a legacy project. You'll get to put your stamp on, on this piece as well. Chairperson O'Keefe. Um, I really think that, to answer your question, I think that um, this project will, it's, they're gonna move on regardless. So they're gonna, this project is gonna happen regardless, but us having like, being able to put our print on this project is something that I think that one the students would want and something that I think I think we should be, play a part in partnering with them so we would just be pro giving them their production cost on top of everything else that they need regardless of um, paying the artist itself Advisor Fonseca. I would also, um, you know, present to you, to you all that historically the student government has been an active partner in providing resources towards um, art on campus. Um, I don't know if, if many of you know this, um, but student government was responsible for providing funding for the tw for 22 uh, sculptures that are on campus um, and started that practice back in 1972. Um, and so I think your predecessors have. Um, often have been approached for years, right, at least at this point, 22 times, um, for uh, resources to secure um, a, um, wow, I had lost my words, sculptures on campus. Um, and so I would, I would also encourage that we evaluate of a continued, I mean, I appreciate that point of, of the legacy that student government in the past has, um, has created and had, um, and just the opportunity of, when you all come back in 10, 15 years to campus, that you can see something that you were um, a part of as well as, as your predecessors often do when they visit campus and were a part of those, those uh, decisions as well. So I would also throw that in there just for some historical uh, context of other ways in which the student government has been engaged in this process in the past. Senator Owens. Um, if these funds do not get allocated to the project, uh, what are your alternative means of funding? Uh, as I said, the, the funding is secured. So we, uh, I mean, we may seek another partner. I don't know who that would be at this point, but the, the funding is secured. Um, the one thing that is not in the original budget is signage. So if SGA supports the production costs um, of the $14,000, that frees up some funding for signage. So I could you know, make sure that SGA is also recognized 
in that signage. Um, and signage is insanely expensive. <laughs> so um, I think, and I think it'll be really critical there on the site. It just wasn't in the original budget in the you know amount that we could identify. So. Uh, Chairperson Owens, or Okiri, excuse me, did you also gain insight and work with the Budget and Finance Committee on this? Yes, actually at the, the summer is when we heard about this and we're finally getting to discuss this um, proposal. Um, when it was first given to me um, under, at the time, Speaker Kirk, um, we had the conversation, Gabe, Olga, and I, we sat down and we had the conversation of, well, whose committee is going to get this and why is this committee getting this? And we had the discussion. And uh, I do have Chairperson Lesnick's um, approval on this. <laughs> Thank you. Senator Ping, or Senator Wang, sorry. Hi, uh, so I'm still a little bit new to this, so I just wanted to clarify that if we allocated the $15,000, how much would we have left to allocate to other funds? I will yield the question to... <laughs> <laughs> uh, so historically when we find, so this is called supplemental, supplemental funding, um, and so the resources from this come out of the student fees reserves, um, which at this point has about $700,000 in it. Um, it isn't often a fund that we dip into unless there are special projects um, in which the student government decides to uh, provide funding to. Um, and I'm gonna go back to say that number is a very rough number. I don't know it off the top of my head, but it is a significant chunk um, that often is used to fund initiatives like this um, when there are folks who submit requests for them. So a $15,000 um, subtraction from that would not be a substantial um, decrease to that overall allocation, to that overall fund. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Any senators who have not spoken at this time? <laughs> Seeing none, we will close the questioning. Thank you for taking the time to come out tonight. Um, because this is a first read, we will not go into debate. Thank you again. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. At this time, we'll move to item four under section eight, and the clerk will read. Act on request to approve SB-65-088, appointing Benjamin Schwartz to the position of associate justice. Thank you, is the author here and wish to speak? The floor is yours. Good evening, everyone. So. Uh, within my time being as president, we have been interviewing a lot of individuals for uh, associate justice. We have an open seat. And uh, one of the questions that I ask uh, continuously to every single person that came in was, what is your reason? Like, wh give me your why. No one wants to do this, so why do you want to do this? Um, and uh, every now and then it was because I want to advocate for students. I want to do basically what y'all do, what senators do. And so then I would refer them to the Senate, to apply for the Senate. Um, for Benjamin, he came in and I asked him that question and he said, because law, the law interests me. And so then I'm like, okay. Um, I start paying attention more. And he tells me that he wants to, he wants to advocate, but the, the advocation for the law. So. Anything within the Constitution, the student body Constitution that we have, and the bylaws, so whenever it is being, uh, if anything happens to a student within parking, within the Constitution violations, he wants to be able to make sure that the students are best protected with under um, the Constitution and bylaws that we have. Um, he's a very strong individual that is uh, not afraid to advocate for what the law says, not only just by what he believes, but what exactly the Constitution and the bylaws say. I'm very confident in this individual, and within that, I yield my time to my nominee. Is the nominee here and wish to speak? The floor is yours. Good evening. 
Thank you all for your time and thank you President Kirk for the nomination. I'm excited to have this opportunity and to be considered for this position. I'll start by telling you a little bit, a, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Benjamin Schwartz. I usually go by Ben. Um, I am a transfer student. This is my first semester at Wichita State University. Um, previously, I spent two years studying at St. Olaf College, which is a school in Northfield, Minnesota, um, studying theater and political science. Um, I have always enjoyed studying policy and the law. This position attracted me for several reasons. First, there is, of course, the stock answer. I want to be involved in my community. But it goes much deeper than that. Um, I am passionate about the study of law and its application. The intricacies of written policy are very engaging to me. I also believe that true justice comes through proper oversight, and the court must be that oversight. If confirmed, I will be a justice who stands for proper application of the Constitution, bylaws, and statutes in all cases. I believe that precedent is important, and the decisions of previous courts should be respected. I also believe that activism is not a court's job. A court's primary job is to interpret the law as it currently stands. A little bit about my qualifications for this position. As I stated earlier, I studied political science at my previous school. Um, I spent uh, two years taking various courses on constitutional law, um, getting a glimpse at how government operates, how courts operate within that government, and um, proper conduct and methods of writing that should be used. Um, this background will form the foundation of my philosophy as a justice should I be confirmed tonight. I applied for this position because I believe it is the best way for me to serve my fellow students. Proper interpretation of the law is one of the most important aspects of a governing body, and I know my addition to the court would further that goal. Thank you so much for your time. I will now stand for questions. Thank you. Are there any questions, Senator Barlow? Who's your favorite founding father and why? That's a good question. Um, I'm going to say Alexander Hamilton, because I think he's underappreciated for all of the various writings that he's done that I think contributed a lot to the framework of our Constitution and our laws. Are there any other questions at this time? Senator Ava? So for the time that you have been here, have you seen something that specific, if you want to share, that you do have a problem with, like, saying upholding the law, correct? One thing, like, on campus or anything that you've seen that you do have a problem with that you wish to address? So I think that my role as a justice would mostly be to ensure that the law is applied correctly. Um, so I don't know that I have a specific issue that I've necessarily uh, seen yet, but I think that is the point of, of hearing the facts of the case and, and letting those determine what decisions are made. Thank you. Are there any further questions at this time? Seeing none, we thank you for your time. We'll now move into the debate period. Is there anybody who would like to speak in affirmation and negation? Senator Warden. Hello. Um, so I will be speaking in affirmation of Ben. Um, I have gotten the chance to talk to him, kind of get to know him. Um, and I mean, although he's a very funny guy and just general talking, um, he seems very um, like determined on achieving his goals. Um, I mean, he did say he was a transfer student. I felt like he spoke well-rounded. I felt like he was a well-rounded person. Um, he, I just... I have a lot of confidence that he's going to get things done. Um, and I know me and a couple of other senators or people part of SGA have talked to him and letting him try to kind of get into the whole legislation or just student government as a whole. So I'm very excited that he has finally had a chance to come in and speak to y'all. Um, so I will be voting in favor. Thank you, Chairperson Lane. I will also be speaking in affirmation for Ben. He is very knowledgeable and has intensive background in law and political science. And I feel like he would really thrive in this role through his experiences, as he mentioned, and also his honesty as a person. So I encourage you all to also vote in affirmation. Thank you, Chairperson Williams. Thank you. Um, I only met Mr. Schwartz about a month ago through a mutual friend of ours, and I've been nothing short uh, of impressed by this individual. His extensive political and civil knowledge is beyond formidable and second only to his desire to learn more and grow as an individual. When it comes to confirming a new justice, I place a high importance on finding a candidate that not only checks all the boxes, but is here for the long run. And I believe that President Kirk has found that person in Mr. Schwartz. So I encourage you all to join me in voting in favor of this nominee. Thank you. Is there anybody who would like to speak in negation? Seeing none, we will close the voting period. Um, 
We will move into the voting period. A is yes to approve, B is no, and C is abstain, and the voting is now open. With 38 yes, zero no, and one abstention, the motion passes. Congratulations. We will now move into item five under section eight. The clerk will read. Act on request to approve SB-65-089, funding request for Umama Ali. Is the author here and wants to speak? The floor is yours. Okay, um, good evening. Ms. Ali is requesting $1,500. She is a health professions graduate student. Um, the conference is called the American Public Health Association Conference. It's in Boston, November 6th through the 9th. Um, the requester has already been accepted um, for a poster presentation at the American Public Health Association Conference. And her research is on improving health literacy in rural women through health literacy data and enhance, enhance access to care. Thank you, and senators, I'd like to remind you that the funding request application is in the Teams folder. At this time, are there any questions for the author? Seeing none, thank you. We will now move into the debate period. Is there anybody who'd like to speak in affirmation or negation? Yes, Senator Uh I think, what this is for is really good. I like, I really like what, like the title. I think it's a really big thing. And I think whenever we can send someone from Wichita State to a conference and then they could kind of increase their uh, like workplace, get more opportunities outside of that, I think it's important. And looking at the budget, it doesn't seem too bad. I know like travel expenses especially is needed. So I think this is not bad at all. I'd like it. Is there anybody else who would like to speak in affirmation or negation? And without objection, uh, if there are no objections, I'd like to approve uh, this with unanimous consent. Seeing no objection, it is passed with unanimous consent. At this time, we will move to item six under section eight. The clerk will read. Act on request to approve SB-65-090, appointing Alyssa Pfeiffer to be the media relations director. The floor is yours. Good, good evening again, everyone. So, um, as we were uh, completing our cabinet uh, here in the executive branch, um, we went out and started asking tons of people throughout, um, not, even, not just the College of Fine Arts, but throughout everywhere for a media director. Um, the responsibilities uh, for the media director is really to make sure everything social media related, uh, videos, graphics, um, everything that comes out from us is marketed well. And it's not just for the executive branch, uh, it is for the legislative branch, everyone, uh, so that SGA as a whole is um, promoted well uh, and just represented well. Um, as meeting with this individual, she has just, uh, shown tons of different experience with working with the wingnuts here in Wichita, doing their promotional uh, and video videography for their games, to uh, individual contracted work for weddings and everything. Um, and with that, I would like to surrender the rest of my time to the nominee. Thank you. Is the nominee here and wish to speak? The floor is yours.
Good evening. It's an honor to be before you all today, and I'd like to thank President John Kirk for the nomination. My name is Alyssa Pfeiffer, and I'm hoping to assume the role of media director for the Wichita State government, student government. I believe I have the experience required for the Wichita State student government uh, media director role uh, and the ability to produce quality content that engages the student body and promotes student government as an active part of our campus society. As someone who knew very little about student government when I first started at Wichita State two years ago, um, I believe that creating quality, engaging video, photography, and graphic design content to promote online and on social media is key to engaging all students on campus and building harmony within our school. I do have a slides presentation to further explain why I would be a good fit for this role, which highlights some examples of my work. Currently, I am employed with the Wichita Wind Surge minor league baseball team. As a video production specialist with the team, I have knowledge of all aspects of sports videography, but my position specifically deals with motion graphics used on the Jumbotron during the games, as well as on the TV broadcast. I operate computing systems that push out the graphics, and I hope this next season to be a creator of new graphics. I also do the same job at Butler County Community College for their football season. I am a film major here at Wichita State, and I am a graphic design minor as well, and I have been fortunate enough to be a part of countless projects through my college. Aside from projects in class ranging from short films, documentary shorts, and other studio work, I also find myself out in the elements often, whether it be shooting films with my professors, working with the Wichita State dance program and their hired guest choreographers, or doing work independently to build my portfolio of work. I was also lucky enough to be a juror at the 2022 Tallgrass Film Festival for the selection of work sponsored by the School of Digital Arts. Um, and it's a festival that I hope to return to next year as a filmmaker. Through my work with the School of Digital Arts, I have earned scholarships for my work and I continue to accept opportunities that allow me to grow and develop my skills to a higher degree. Along with my sports videography and student work, I also do freelance work with some recent projects being a demo reel for a local news anchor with KWCH and a wedding video that I shot and plan to edit within a month's time. I believe that this work is important because it allows me to work with a, with a client once and needs and I feel as if that is the most of, one of the most um, valuable things to learn as a creative. Working with student government will allow me both the flexibility and freedom to create while also using an existing brand and identity to build upon and grow. I thrive off of feedback and I strive for perfection in anything I do, and I believe that makes me an asset to any team I'm on. The next two slides just show little clips of my video production work, um, followed by a small portfolio of my photo and graphic design work. So if we go on to the next slide. I don't know, you might have to click that link. I don't know if there's a way for me to. <laughs> yes, as you can see. <laughs> Awesome, okay. So, <laughs> start off, the first clip is just a piece that I've done um, in my time as a student here at WSU. This kind of example uh, exemplifies more of my creative work as a filmmaker, um, which isn't necessarily what I'd be doing for this role, but it is what I hope to achieve in my career, so I feel like it's important to show. The second clip is a video that I just pushed out on Sunday with the help of our president and vice president for Diversity Week. Um, this was something that I shot and edited in about six hours, and with subtitles and everything, I think that it shows what I hope to really accomplish for this organization. Um, and then the next three clips are kind of examples of what I've done on campus. So there was a game design student who is a student at the School of Digital Arts who I edited a reel for. Um, just kind of showing that even though I am a film-based creator, I am able to work with other concentrations. This was an example of a freelance project that I did taking existing content and um, converting it into something for a client and using their suggestions to 
better it. And then this was an example of what I did with the Wichita State dance program. And they had a guest choreographer who I went out with and shot on the field, worked with lighting and framing to create a project they were proud of. And that's that for the video examples. Um, back to the slideshow. The last slide just shows a little bit of my photography and graphic design work. Obviously, photography is a major part um, of this role. And I have examples of studio work. Um, there's a couple of senior portraits in there that I did for my sister, who's sitting at the back of the room, um, as well as some more creative photography, um, landscape and non-human photography, and then some graphic designs that I did for clients as well as for my own personal brand. So I'll finish by saying that student government is a very vital part of our campus here at WSU, but I don't always see people knowing a lot about it or engaging with it all that much. My goal is to produce content that highlights the event, work, and achievements that this association has, and I believe that my years of applied experience in the world of digital arts makes me more than capable to take on this role. Thank you. Um, sorry, I just, while I'm already up, uh, are there any questions at this time for the nominee? Yes, yeah, Senator Barlow. What are some ideas you've already generated for how you can increase the public perception of SGA? Yeah, so um, first and foremost, I think social media is a very, very powerful tool. I think that you're going to be hard pressed to find a student on campus who isn't actively involved with social media. Oh, well, okay, now I know one. Um, but I think that using this existing brand that student government has of being diverse, of being inclusive, and of being kind of this voice for the students, um, I think that creating engaging um, events and then being able to promote those events through social media but if not on social media then definitely on the website and definitely around campus there are plenty of televisions everywhere I know School of Digital Arts is obviously very big with promoting student work but I think that promoting the work that's being done on campus to represent our students is just as important and like I did with the video for diversity and inclusion I hope to make more videos um, not only promoting events but also showing some of the highlights from those events to encourage future students to come out and be just as active. Thank you. Are there any other questions at this time? Senator Bastian. Hi. Um, so you do some pretty high quality work. What if you get a better offer than the SGA? Like, will you just quit and then we'll be scrambling to find a new person? <laughs> no, I have no plans to do that. I think that one of the coolest parts about having film as a career is that I'm able to do a lot at once because it's not your typical nine to five job. I think that this job is something that I can really put a lot of time and effort into when I'm not doing other things. I think that I'm able to kind of accept and deny opportunities as see fit. This one is especially important to me because not only being a student here on campus, but having a little sister, having friends on campus, it's very important to me to make this campus an engaging place for all students because I came in to um, this campus when it was the middle of COVID, so I didn't necessarily feel super engaged. And I want to make client or content that makes other people feel that way. I am only a student here for two more semesters, but for the rest of my duration here at Wichita State, I want to put time and energy into this um, so that I do have an impact and a footprint that made Wichita State a better place. Thank you. Any other questions at this time? Seeing none, thank you for taking the time to make this presentation and coming out today. Um, you can stay or leave for debate. At this time, is there anybody who would like to speak in affirmation or negation? Senator Warden. Hello again. I feel like I've been talking tonight, but there's just been so much good fine arts here today, and it makes my heart warm. Um, I am definitely going to be voting in favor of her. I enjoyed all of her samples that she brought up, including her reel and all the different work she's done. Um, it makes me it makes me so giddy. Um, but I'm super excited to for the things she has planned for the future. I'm just super excited. She'll be working under another. I mean, John Kirk is a fine arts person, so. <laughs> um, and I hope to work with her in the future, and I hope she can take my grad photos in the spring. <laughs> Thank you. Chairperson Okiri. 
Um, I would like to speak in affirmation of this candidate. Um, I got to work one-on-one, -on -one, well, with a group, with Alyssa this past weekend, as you obviously saw the Diversity Week post. Um, and her just ability to fit, like change, because like, so we didn't plan for it to be outside, and for her ability to just be like, hey, we can't get inside of this building right now, but like the sun hasn't gone down yet, let's adapt. Um, I thought it was just amazing. And I mean, just look at that video, view it. Okay, that's all I have to say. <laughs> Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak during this debate period? Seeing none, I would like to motion to pass with unanimous consent. And seeing no objection, the uh, nominee, congratulations. <laughs> At this time, we will close section eight and move into section nine, and I motion to move into the committee of the whole. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. I was scared for a second. <laughs> At this time, we will move into uh, the committee of the whole starting with item one, food insecurity, and I believe Advisor Fonseca and Advisor McLean have an exciting announcement to make for everyone. Sorry, Gabriel and Brandon have an exciting announcement. Hi. Hi. Thank you. So, you know, it's, it's fascinating. Last week we were here to talk to you all about uh, you know, concerns we had with funding and other things. And then the very next day, we get a very fun email uh, from our friends at the Kansas Board of Regents. Excuse me. Uh, yes. I'm so sorry. Yes. Uh, Senators, uh, the ruffling, I want to remind you that you will have to vote to get out tonight. So please be mindful of that. Thank That's you. a very good point. Thank you. The bell doesn't dismiss you. The speaker does. Uh, that was funny. I just saw a TikTok about that. That was funny. Anyways, so uh, the very next day, we got a very fun announcement um, that we're going to share. Uh, and it's, as I say it out loud, I'm like, oh, now we're live streamed. So there's probably going to be so many questions. So I will answer them to the best of my ability. But, um, you know, during the pandemic, the federal government gave um, the states um, chunks of money, uh, lots of them to be exact. Um, and a part of our conversations that occurred, and I hope she's not watching because I don't want her to get a big head even more, our former student body president and former student body treasurer worked with the regents uh, to establish um, ways that uh, we can get some uh, support from them with the former chair of the regents and everything. Uh, and so last week they announced that each of the region institutions would be uh, receiving a chunk of money uh, from their leftover pot uh, that was a total of $600,000, and we are going to be receiving $105,000. Uh, towards the Shocker Support Locker. <laughs> like, welcome to me. Yes, you're welcome. Um, so we're excited for that contribution. Uh, it is on a, it's funny because right, our processes, we do a reimbursement for individuals and organizations. The same thing, it's a reimbursement that they're going to give us. Uh, so that is going to be a complete game changer for us as we continue to uh, purchase uh, stock and supplies for the locker. Um, it is very, it's restricted to just food and, um, and hygiene products, uh, but it's very limited to, or not limited, it's very broad to what they define um, as uh, hygiene products. So that's gonna be a great thing for us as we uh, continue to, uh, one, purchase things, but two, um, also stockpile um, shelf-stable things that we can as well. So that is super exciting um, as we begin that process of utilizing those dollars. Um, so it still does not change the fact that uh, we need to establish some permanent funding because that money has to be spent by June. Um, and then once it's spent, it's spent. Um, so we'll be looking at uh, continuing conversations about things that we can produce or, or provide within SGA's budget uh, to continue the uh, lasting impact for the locker and the funding for that as well. So it's a great thing for us now um, as we continue to purchase items and purchase things. Uh, but ultimately, long term, we'll still need to work on um, some solution work with there. So uh, that is exciting and super helpful and we're uh, grateful for uh, the regions and that contribution as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions from last week that we didn't get to. Um, I don't know if there's anything else that we want to bring up for it, but if there's any other uh, questions or, or even comments that folks have that they want us to look at or, or want us to respond to, we are happy uh, to do that. Advisor Fonseca, can you uh, talk about the comparison between our school and uh, 
the amount that KU and K-State received as well? I think that's exciting as well. Yes, that's a great question. So they got $5,000 more. Uh, so they got 110. Um, and I'm not going to talk trash or smack on our colleagues over there. Uh, but yeah, they got $5,000 more than what ours is. Um, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so in comparison to those bigger schools, mm. that's, that's yeah, really good. Yeah, it's not that far off. Yeah, yes, and I think that's, that's really, really good. good. And I, I would say each of the schools, and I don't know if any of you really know this, but each of the six schools, including Washburn making sevens, and Washburn is not a full region institution, uh, they all operate food pantries on their campus. Um, and we're uh, really grateful for our partnership with all of them as we continue to kind of talk about best practices and things that work at their institution. Um, you know, we base some of our things based off of uh, K-State's and KU's model, and they've based some of their things off of our model as well. So it's been a really good uh, collaborative effort between us and the rest of the institutions uh, and their food pantries. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Is there any questions or comments at this time? Vishnu? So I know you guys have like those donations or like sponsors. I was just wondering, I forgot, have you guys talked with like or had any opportunities with like Cargill? Because I know they have like a new uh, headquarters in Wichita, I was wondering if, like, if there's any opportunity for that, especially because there's a cargo cafe in Woosley. Yeah, so we're a part of our um, overall conversations that we're looking at for some long, uh, long term uh, uh, stability. Uh, it's also re. Um, restarting and or re-engaging with some of our corporate uh, partners and sponsors. Um, and so I know that Brandon is gonna continue to uh, do some work with that, with Caitlin as well. Um, and so we are, uh, so yes, to your question and long story, uh, continuing to even work with other uh, corporate sp uh, sponsors uh, as we continue to figure out long-term pieces for that. I think the really good thing, um, as I mentioned last week, as we move into the Shocker Success Center, which is gonna be the what Clinton Hall's new name will be, um, there's already some partners um, that are working uh, to provide some uh, long-term funding and, uh, for that as well. So we're uh, continuing to work on some of those partnerships and, and creating newer ones as well. Thank you. Any other uh, individuals wishing to speak at this time? Seeing none, thank you. Two things before I wrap up. I encourage, like I mentioned last week, if you have not visited the locker, I encourage you to stop by uh, to do that. It is located in Grace Wilkie. Uh, if you would like one of us to take you down there uh, and talk to you a little bit more about it, we are happy uh, to do that. Please just let us, let's do this. Let Brandon know and we will coordinate a time to get you down there uh, if you'd like to see it personally. Um, as I also encourage that as you engage with peers on campus uh, to encourage them to utilize uh, that service. Um, like, I think 11 to 1. Oh, I should know this. The hours? No, it's 10 to 1. Ooh, 10 to 1, <laughs> Monday to Thursday, and then 9 to noon on Friday. So I encourage you uh, to share that information with your peers, uh, but then I'll, again, if you have not stopped by to see it, uh, to, to do that. And if you have the ability to uh, volunteer, to also do that as well. November 14th. November 14th. Thank you, Mackenzie. Other questions or comments? Uh, Kylie? Um, is food for fun still going on? Because your girl's got a parking ticket that she does not want to pay. <laughs> uh, yeah, so food for fines is typically the second week of every month. Um, so we will uh, get ready to put it out uh, starting Tuesday next week. Um, and it goes Tuesday? Hmm? Wait, it starts Tuesday, though. Tuesday to Friday. Yeah, because we got to give us a Monday time. So yeah, it starts again next week. Um, and December will be the last one until we get back in January, um, and we'll restart it again in February. Yes, if you have not done that, please do that. Uh, we are making, and actually a really good point that you brought that up, we are making a change to our food for finds process. Uh, we used to put the form on the website, we're taking the form off, um, and now you have to physically come to the student government's office to complete it, uh, to ensure that you completed the parking quiz and that you make the uh, proper donations as well. So yes, if you have not done the parking quiz, please do that, um, and it is a requirement to participate in the program as well. Michelle. Um. So the food for fines part, like if I get a ticket, how long before I pay it off? Or do I just wait till the food, to, food for fines thing is active? Or do I have to pay for it 
and mm. just not be able to do the food for fines. So you get 20 days before it's transferred to your um, student account, and typically when it happens, uh, when food for fines is active, and so keep in mind it's only active during um, August to May, uh, so like the summers don't count, we typically deal with that in August, um, you're able to, as you, like for example, if you get a ticket, in a week, um, you will have enough, and it's 20 business days, so you will have enough days until the next Food for Fines uh, to participate in the program. I would always say and encourage you as you engage with your peers and for folks who are watching, um, if you get a ticket and you pay for it or you do the appeal process before Food for Fines, you cannot participate in Food for Fines. So it is the prior to submitting the appeal. So I would encourage uh, for you all to clarify to folks and for folks who are watching, um, if you get a ticket, wait to do the appeal until if you miss the food for fine deadline for whatever reason, uh, then do it. But if you, can, if you submit the appeal um, and you participate in food for fines, there is an administrative fee and that does not cover the administrative fee. So always encourage folks to do the food for fines program before you start an appeals process. Senator Howard, did you still have something? Where's that parking quiz at? Uh, so the link is on the Student Advocates website, um, but it's also on the parking uh, website. So if you go to wichita.edu backslash student advocate, it's going to be on that page. Also, it's on uh, wichita.edu backslash parking. Any other questions or comments at this time? Seeing none, thank you thank for taking you. the time to talk about this topic. And as we close that section, I would just remind everybody that food insecurity is still a big issue that not only st people outside of campus, but also students on campus face. So continue to think of ways that we can better support our students here at Wichita State. At this time, I'll move into item two under section nine, misgendering and incorrect use of, of pronouns. And I'll turn the floor over to Iris and McKenzie. Thank you, Greg. <laughs> we'll just leave it to McKinsey. Oh. <laughs> oh, okay. Anyways, so we're back to talk about working on addressing the issues of misgendering and incorrect pronoun usage in the classroom setting. So as talked about in both our reports, uh, in the previous week, a senator has brought to our attention uh, this issue in the classroom setting and has expressed the concerns from spectrum and discrimination in the LGBTQ plus community. Um, with this, we held meetings last week with spectrum president and members to discuss their issues in order to draft a uh, resolution to recommend professors follow university policies in regards to discrimination. So if you're unaware, course policies and university policies are required. Hold on. Let's try this again. Okay. Okay, course policies and university policies are outlined at the end of every single syllabus. It is, sometimes they take you to the link on the um, WSU page, but it is required by every professor. This is not up to professor discretion. Like, it is not uh, just added in the syllabus here and there. It is at the very end of every professor's and is required because it's university policy. So it must be abided by. Um, and so we are addressing that and essentially trying to draft a resolution recommending that uh, professors follow that university course policy because it hasn't been uh, followed. And uh, we're hoping to kind of hear any suggestions uh, that any senators may have to add to our resolution. And I'm going to yield the rest of my time for Chairperson O'Kerry. Iris. <laughs> OK. Um, can I put this down? Yeah. Okay. Great. OK, so Wichita State has actually several resources for reporting, whether it's bias, discrimination, or misconduct. Um, you can file a report if you visit wichita.edu slash administration slash O-I-E-C. Um, there are committees set in place by faculty and administration on campus for students to report these things to. If you are not comfortable with, re with reporting, you can still report anonymously. Just skip the first part of that um, part on the website. Um, and to my understanding, once you report it, the department will send it to Title IX or Berg or the misconduct, et cetera. I currently sit on the Berg, which is the biased incident report group. We go through incidents and we see how we can best assess these issues. Um, WSU currently does a poor job of advertising these resources, but I'm currently working with administrators to address these concerns and ensure that students have this information. If you have questions on what my thoughts are, let me know and I can tell you what I've told them. Yeah. 
Iris, I would also recommend the easier way to get to that form if for some reason you forget that long email or that long website is wichita.edu backslash report it, and it provides every single reporting form, um, including the Berg one. Are you, you saying no? When I tried to do the report it, because I thought it was that easy, it's not that easy. Um, there's a lot of words in between, so that one was the easiest one to get to the... Yeah, that's the short link. So if it's just re backslash report it, and that will take you directly to I just tried it. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Are there any um, senators that have suggestions, comments, or questions for these two as they get prepared to make their resolution? Zane? Uh, I just want to say, I mean, especially for the report it, I mean, it's just as easy as, like, just typing and report it, Wichita, and then bam, it's literally the first link. So uh, if you need to report anything, just feel free to use that resource, and it's really easy to find and pretty easy to use. Uh, as an RA, I've had to fill out um, the, I can't think of the, the conduct incident response forms, um, and I mean, it's, you know, you put in all the information and it goes in, and I, at least I know for incident response, they're normally pretty quick at assessing those forms and making sure that you get the help or that you get recognized uh, in your or report. So. Thank you. Uh, Senator Haynes? Yeah, want to camera? Yeah, right, good. Um, good evening. I think that this resolution is something that we really need, um, especially, ooh, let me not. Actually, let me say it. We can, um, for if the campus wants to be as um, inclusive as it claims or advertises, I believe that this is something that should be taken seriously, and those who do not follow said policies should be seriously held accountable. Um, so y'all have my full support with this. AJ, I'd like to follow up with that. How would you propose that individuals who aren't following are held accountable? Um, to me, a simple thing is you you get written up, you get sanctioned for it because to me that kind of behavior isn't um, isn't something that we should tolerate in any shape or form. Um, with regards to like um, the misgendering and dead naming and stuff, um, I don't think that's something adults should or people should do in general, let alone professionals, especially to us as students, because let it be known, schools do not exist without students. <coughs> Flat out. We are, ooh. <laughs> I could try to say it as nice as I can. As I said before, we, the students, literally make the school, right? Without us, they have nothing. So the least that they should do is treat us with respect. Thank you. Are there any other comments, suggestions, or questions at this time for these two? Senator Mallard? I know a lot of stuff happens on campus. Uh, me and my partner had to write a report five weeks ago. Um, but I'm meeting up with, with someone, so I'm not going to mention that until later. But I can tell you that there are a lot of people on campus who do not feel safe with, with reporting what happens on campus. Like I was meeting up w with someone yesterday, and they said that they had talked about it to, to their RA, and their RA said, eh, yeah, we'll talk to that person. They didn't even talk to the person, and that person is still vi 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 violating policies and just kind of bringing the this f forward because we need to fa figure out a way to let people know and if anyone has a, has a suggestion that they are safe in case so something happens because I know a lot of people are also don't feel safe that they might get hurt or they might hurt hurt their friend or whatever something I want to put forward thank you Senator Victoria Owens hi um this is a general question to whoever can answer. Uh, who is responsible for looking through those reports and also ensuring that those reports are properly uh, responded to and that accountability is given? Um, from my understanding from the Berg and how that works and how there are multiple different like committees for different um, 
types of misconduct that occur. So there's Title IX, they have their specialist, the Berg, they have students on there as well as a whole bunch of different administration from different departments. Um, for the discriminatory one, there's a whole committee for that. So to my understanding, and what Berg has done is we will like sit in our committees, we will go through whatever incidents have come to us through the report it, and then we assess them by, without knowing people's names, because some people don't want to, they want to be anonymous, we talk through them and we better assess how we can solve their issues. and then the administration also takes it within their own hands to meet with these students and make sure that they are safe or whatever's happening with them, they know what's going on and they know that they have these resources. Go ahead. Um, well, this could just be well, one, I'd love to get the leader of that organization um, in to talk to us to be able to discuss their process and also uh, what the enforcement for those for that accountability looks like. In addition to that, I think it would clear up a lot of misconceptions and confusion because on the topic of uh, RAs, I'm an RA personally, um, and I know uh, we have a few senators here who are RAs. Um, reports like that go directly to our supervisor and our boss. We are not equipped to handling those because we don't have the authority to. So I just love to get in contact with a person who does have that authority because when I get those reports and send them off to my boss, I don't know where they go. Um, and we don't get a follow up on that either. So I'd love to get that both to clarify for all of us as senators, but also the people who are RAs in this room to be able to um, discuss that with their residents and be able to better clarify that when people are um, you know, getting reports because I know it's just been like a this big like blank space of just like, it just goes into that like black hole and we don't know where it goes and it's just like stays there forever. So I'd love to get that clarified for everybody. Thank you, Mark, Mark Brown. Oh, can I address that I'll real quick? Right Thank you. Um, that's another thing that we definitely wanna look into is coming with this resolution is not only making sure that those course policies are enforced in uh, the classroom setting, uh, both online students. This includes asynchronous students if you feel like, you know, you don't have a lot of face-to-face -face engagement with your professor, but you still feel like um, there's issues there. Those are still conversations that we wanna have and we wanna make sure that black hole conversation doesn't really happen. Students are seeing, um, anonymous or not, students are seeing their, uh, concern be addressed directly and uh, it's not a continuous I'm reporting I'm reporting I'm reporting and I'm not seeing anything happen so that's a big part that we want to address on top of this resolution so uh, hopefully a lot of collaboration students that are sharing their personal experiences I encourage you to um, start talking start if you feel comfortable with it obviously um, start talking so that we can keep addressing these problems and make sure that they are you guys are fully seeing the solutions that uh, you're working for when you're applying to or filling out that report. Mark. So this isn't directly germane to the mispronoun issue that's kind of started this discussion tonight. Um, I'm really just curious, as students serving in a facility to receive reports, if you receive a report that isn't anonymous and it deals with students that you know personally, do you have an obligation to recuse yourself from that reporting process, or what does that look like for you? There's only been one Berg meeting <laughs> that I've been on, and n names were crossed out, so I'm gonna assume that they were all anonymous. Prior to that, I would ask Dr. Austin if, if I did know someone, what that would look like, but currently that hasn't happened to me yet, so I don't really know, but I would probably abstain from it personally, just because morally speaking, I don't think that that's, yeah. So there's not, to your question, there's not an obligation like we do, like we have here. Um, so the, the Berg is, is designated for the person who holds the DEI chair position to be SGA's representative. The student advocate sits on it as well. One of the student advocates sits on it as well. Um, and a couple um, other students, the uh, Multicultural uh, Greek Council President, the National Panhellenic Council President, um, and that might be the only four. So there's not an, Unlike here, right, where we have that the ethics policy, there's not an obligation for the students on Berg to recuse themselves because I think Berg is um, 
it's an it's a an, um, an avenue in which we receives these complaints. Um, it isn't um, a disciplinary body at all whatsoever. Um, those responsibilities of enforcing policy belong to the offices in which those uh, cases might come under. Uh, so if it's specifically about a student organization, then my office is responsible for addressing those issues. If it's about a student in a classroom, then academic affairs is responsible for addressing that. It's really the avenue to say, in what ways can we provide support to that office to say, here are the things that we are seeing and the concerns that we received. Um, here's where we believe there are issues and concerns to be addressed and we are happy to provide you the resources and the support to address those concerns and we'll be following up a little bit later to see how those are, were addressed. So it's really much more of instead of three people who, the, there are three people who co-chair that group, um, of them just saying, yep, this is what this is. It's more of let's engage with the rest of the, of the group and, and, and really have a deep dive conversation about in what ways can we provide support to the student or the person, because it's not just students, faculty and staff utilize it as well. Uh, in what ways can we provide resources to the person to be supportive and in what ways can we also provide um, accountability and education or recommend accountability and then provide education as well. Um, I sit on the Berg as well, um, representing uh, my office. Um, and I would, I would agree that even the information that's provided to the members um, are all redacted because, right, we're also trying to check our own bias as we address these issues um, and trying to be, uh, to provide specific redactions that would eliminate bias from being um, brought into that particular case. So the only three people that actually know who the, the people that are impacted um, are the three chairs, or three co-chairs. Does that maybe answer your question? Are any of the co-chairs students, or is that all faculty? Uh, so it's the dean of students, who is one of the co-chairs, our chief diversity officer, so Dr. Marche Fleming Randall is the other one, and then Mike Irvine, um, who's currently the interim director of the Office of Institutional Equity and Compliance. So all uh, administrators. Thank you. Is there anybody else who would like to speak at this time? Go, go ahead. Um, basically, the plan is to draft this resolution so we can start getting ready for Friday. So if you guys have anything, I know that's a kind of short timeline, but feel free to email Iris or I, and we will make sure to get any other issues you feel like need to be addressed um, in there. We have spoke with Spectrum, Spectrum's ready, and uh, we're getting ready to work with them on that. So they're in the loop for sure, but we definitely want to hear any other opinions and make sure we can address as much as possible with this resolution and then keep going with that forward. Uh, we're hoping that this gets addressed and that uh, the university is hold to those, the policies that they are supposed to, and moving forward, we can go from there. So yeah, thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, Gregory. I just have yes. one quick thing I have to say, Gregory. Thank you, Gregory. Um, I'm going to milk that. Um, I just wanted to give the senator who brought this attention, uh, or brought this to the Senate's attention, some flowers. I'm not going to, uh, unless they want to be named, um, I just wanted to give them the flowers that they deserve because this is, as I continuously mention this every Senate meeting, um, in our one on ones and our committee meetings, um, this is exactly why you are in this space to address the issues of the student body, to bring it forward to the Senate and address the problems as a Senate. And then at, once you all address the problems, identify solutions and write up some legislation about it. This is how Senate works. And I am so proud of you all. Um, I'm not going to choke. I don't know why I'm really choking up right now. But um, just thank you so much for the senator who brought this forward. And I cannot wait to see additional stuff come forward. Thank you so much. And um, thank you for that. And moving forward, everybody will be allowed to be addressed by first names except for me. And with that being said, <laughs> I... <laughs> I motion to uh, return back to the um, agenda and exit committee of the whole. Is there a second? Everybody second. So um, at this time, we will uh, move out of the committee of the whole into section 10 and um, move to the final roll call. So once invited to, please push A to check in for the final roll call, and you are good to check in out. Please push A, because if you abstain, you will be marked absent.
Senators, uh, please remember that we are still in session until I adjourn the meeting. And please rem uh, there are three votes missing at this time while you are still rumbling. All right, and at this time, I hereby adjourn this meeting at 9.02 p.m. Zane, Senator Barry, Zane.